Welcome everyone to Morning Magazine for this May 4th, 2022. It is 10.06 on the clock and you have your host James J. Mayloff here. We are joined today for the entire hour by the Wood County Sheriff's Department. We have in with us Sheriff Sean Becker. Good morning, sir. Good morning, pleasure to be here. Um, good to have you here. And we want to thank our friend Joe, of course, and our friends at Wisconsin Rapids Community Media for being here. Good morning to you guys. Uh, sir, how are you doing? Doing well. It's the the sun is finally shining. Um, that is a that is a cool thing. It gets everybody uh, kind of in the in the mood to get out and you know get a, some outdoor activities and you know stuff like that. And maybe a walk or two in. So it's better than the last few days where it was yeah. uh, you know gloomy and rainy and whatnot. The only problem for me is I. Uh, Ordered a bunch of rock for our landscaping around uh, the house, yeah. and um, the last couple of days I've been spraying that. And Joe and I were talking. It's like those are some muscles I haven't used for a while. So I'm a little <laughs> sore and, and yeah. old, you know, yeah, or, yeah, or a yeah. combination of both. But overall, doing well. Uh, department uh, is uh, you know doing well. Everybody of the team is uh, team is well, and just moving forward. Yeah. One of our uh, talking to one of our listeners this weekend, I told him that you were going to be in and uh, asked me right away. Uh, is there any news on the jail? Is that progressing? The sure. new jail is that progressing well? No, uh, it, it's progressing well. Um, we're really the the design is is pretty much done. We're down to you know just the mechanicals. Mm -hmm. You know where the plumbing is going to be, where the electrical is going to be. Um, you know deciding a lot of those things. So we're hoping by. The end of June, we'll have everything completed as far as uh, that kind of information that needs to go out to bid. Um, so hopefully that, that's what we're looking at, um, probably end of June, that we'll get it out to the bidding process um, for uh, the companies that will be interested in doing that. I, I'm sure we'll have quite a few, um, but that's where we're at. It's, uh, it's come a long while. Um, the committees that have been involved, along with just our team working with the architect and the project manager, uh, just getting down to those really fine details mm -hmm. that I couldn't tell you much about. Yeah, yeah. You know, the facility itself, like I said, is designed. Uh, it's a podular design. Um, you know, it's it, it's going to fit the needs of what what Wood County needs. Uh, it's you know we continually talk about. I was in fact this morning, you know, just talking about the out of county housing. You yeah. know, and the costs with that, and you know the direction that's going in. And you know, I'm I'm looking forward to just you know having the facility open where we don't have to deal with having people housed in other facilities. Um, we've been doing that for a long, long time, over 20 years at a really big, significant cost. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be one thing that, you know, I'm gonna be looking forward to, or I know our team is gonna be looking forward to where, you know, everybody's gonna be under one roof, you know, getting the services that are available. And we're not transporting people back and forth, either to Adams or, or Opaca County for, for various reasons. So, um, yeah, that's one of the big reasons why I'm looking forward to the project being completed, but, um, there's a lot of other things that we've talked about in the show, but the safety issues. And yeah. That. And so the big thing is, uh, hopefully we'll be out to bid in June. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, sometimes usually it'll, we'll give, uh, the construction companies the opportunity for about 30 days to come back with a price. And then we'll know where we're at. You know, the unfortunate thing, um, you know, right now with inflation, mm -hmm. we're looking at, you know, probably a, a cost increase. We don't know what that is. Um, maybe in the next month or two, um, we'll get a better handle on what inflation is looking like and uh, where we are at a cost. Um, the biggest things that we're seeing right now uh, as far as inflation, you know, concerns for the project are electrical, you mm -hmm. know, items um, and detention equipment. Right. We can't just build a facility um, and just grab whatever we want from, mm -hmm. you know, Home Depot or, mm -hmm. or things like that. We have to get de detention grade equipment. And that's a pretty significant cost right now as well. There's um, you know, a lot of other projects in the state of Wisconsin that are similar, um, you know, that are looking for you know equipment like that, and uh, that might set us off at least a little bit of a timeline uh, of when we're going to get those uh, those items. But our county board, you know, a few months ago, did um, you know give the go ahead to procure mm -hmm. you know items, you know, whether it's detention equipment or things that we can purchase now um, that will save us some money, you know, down the road. Um, so we've been looking at, you know, items that we can purchase and, and get them either in storage or that company can hold on to them until we need them and then we can take delivery. So um, that that's helpful um, because you just, these prices are just fluctuating so much. Our project manager from the Samuels Group has been really on, you know, what kind of items we should be looking at, whether it's IT items, um, uh, again, electrical um, you know, equipment or, um, you know, or the detention stuff, what can we get, um, ahead of time? Well, maybe it's a generator, mm -hmm. you know, that might cost, um, 
you know, 20% less than it will in six months. It's just the, the, the market and inflation right now is, um, um, has an effect on the project, unfortunately, but you know, that's, that's happening everywhere Yeah, and we can't control it. Well, and I got to say, uh, after talking to that listener, just doing a little digging myself, uh, this is uh, something that nationally is going on right. where other, other areas, especially specifically rural areas that are just like kind of, they're just starting to get to this point where they're talking about it and going to their County board and seeing if they should get a new jail and that we're a little ahead of the curve on that, right. which is a little kind of funny considering we were kicking the can for quite a while about the subject uh but Just we're a year or two you know yeah. it, um it, to to some of the, the points that you're making there uh we're ahead of the game and in, in a lot of positives mm-hmm. as well with this uh, it's certainly there are unknown factors but right. uh overall we're in a good place with this yeah considering I, you know we've talked about it a lot and what the county board did to get to this point um uh, i give them a, a ton of credit this wasn't my idea. It was an idea that we took a, as a team approach, including not just our team, but the, with the community, with the county board. You know, when we sat down with that ad hoc committee that Lance Pomo created, and we really looked at what the needs are. I mean, do we need this? Because you know, there, there are a lot of skeptics out there. Yeah. And, and I understand that. When you're looking at a, a cost factor of uh, what we costed out at $58 million, it's a lot of our money. Mm-hmm. But we had to look at, all right, what's the future going to look like? Do you want to continue to, like we just mentioned, the out-of-county housing costs and what we're paying now and what that's going to increase to? You mentioned the safety issues. Um, we also talk about a facility that we have right now that was built in the 80s, or actually built in the 50s and added on and remodeled in the 80s. Um, it's an old facility. I mean, there's going to be millions of dollars that are, we're going to have to put into the facility just to upgrade it, to keep it functional. Um, you know, and this is a great segue. We've got a, it's a National Corrections Officer Week, and our COs are doing a phenomenal job. Mm-hmm. You know, they're working in a facility that, um, you know, has those safety issues and, and concerns, and, and it's an older facility, like I mentioned, that you have to adjust to. And when you look at, you know, a newer facility that has that podular design that's more of a safe design for uh, people to watch inmates and, and see what, what's going on where now. You know, our COs put on foot traffic. You know, they're going down in that linear design of, of the long hallways. Oh. And, you know, we require that, you know, every inmate's checked on, you know, at least every half hour. If they're on a mental health watch, it's every 15 minutes. But that's the COs going out and walking down, back and forth, uh, down the facility to making sure that everybody's okay. Uh, but, again, um, highlighting, you know, it's National Corrections Officers Week, and we have just an awesome team back there. Uh, Captain Ted Ashback and, and our team back there have been doing a phenomenal job since I've been in this position. It's just, it's a complete, total team effort, and, and they need to be recognized. And this goes back to 1984, if you lose a little uh, history, Ronald President Reagan um, named this week, um, the first week in May, as National Crackers Week. And, you know, they're the unsung heroes. You know, they're part of the law enforcement team that um, people don't think about much, but, but they're, they're the heroes behind the walls. You know, they have a, a huge role in the criminal justice system and in the law enforcement uh, field, uh, and they just don't get recognized enough. And and to all the corrections officers, not only in our team, but everywhere, um, thank you for what you do. Um, we appreciate you, I appreciate you, and I, I especially appreciate the people that are part of our team. Uh-huh. Um, the current ones, and even the past ones. Uh-huh. You know, it's not an, an easy job. You know, and we, we've had a few uh, of our, our current CEOs, um, you know, leave to take, you know, positions elsewhere. And I get it. I understand, you know, with the job market the way it is, um, you can get a job pretty easily. Um, you know, I miss a lot of them, but I understand that, um, you know, as life moves forward and you, you deal with the stress of, uh, of uh, a field that, you know, in corrections, um, I understand that. But, you know, a lot of them that have left, they're always welcome to come back because with the new facility, we're going to be hiring eight people. Mm. And I've told that to each person that, you know, it's only a couple people that have left recently. But if you want to come back, you know, once once things are done, you're more than welcome to do that because they left in good standing. Mm. You know, uh, we talked about it a little bit on the morning show and, and try to give respect to the position and what it is. Um, but, you know, it, it's one thing for people like I and, and Melissa and that to talk about it. And we haven't done the job or we haven't been around the job before. For those that don't know everything this entails, and not to go through every little aspect of it, but if we can give people a bit of a broad brush of what that mm-hmm. job is, just to so we can really hammer home why this job is so vital. Yeah, it's the safety of, you know, the, the people that are, are in custody are not 
they don't want to be there, but you know their their behavior led led them to be there, mm-hmm. and then it's our duty and obligation to make sure that they stay in custody, and you know we provide a safe environment, and you know getting back to their current facility, um, there is a safety issue there, you know, and you know I, we've had many suicides in the in the facility, you know, where people took their own life, and that's a huge toll on that family, mm. and it's a huge toll on our family, right. our team. Yeah. You know, you look at the corrections officers that. You know, or talking to somebody and making sure that, hey, you're safe, you know, all right, we checked on you, and then minutes later, they're not. Yeah. You know, and we've lost many good corrections officers that have had to, you know, witness those kind of situations, and they're tough. They're very hard on, like I said, it's hard on the community, and it's another reason why we're discussing the, you know, the reasoning why we need a facility. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the life of a corrections officer isn't easy. Uh, our shifts are 12 hours. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, we, um, you know, we check on the inmates every half hour unless there is a, a special need or a mental health watch where we need to check on them more often. And that's not exclusive of those time limits. That's what our requirements are. But our COs are, are doing much more than that. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's really revolved around the safety and the security of the facility and the safety of our own staff. I right. mean, you remember, you have to think about the people that are in custody. They don't want to be there. And, you know, most of them do um, behave, mm-hmm. but some don't. I yeah. mean, they might come in uh, when they're booked in. They, they might be under the influence of mm-hmm. something. Um, they might be having some mental health concerns or issues or a combination of both. And we have to make sure that they're safe mm-hmm. and, and deal with them. Um, so it's it's not a... It's not a, a an easy job, and, and like I said, it's it's nice to know that you know that they're nationally recognized. You know, not just prison guards, but our corrections people, or um, you know, our corrections officers here. You know, with the Wood County Sheriff's Department, they're they're really the heroes behind the wall. I saw a quote on Facebook saying, you know, mentioning that, and that is so true. Yeah. And then also the the partnership. You know, I have to bring up uh, Mid State Technical College. They have a corrections. Um, a, a, degree that you can get and we have such a great partnership with mid-state technical college and uh courtney kostahusky oversees that field over at mid-state and she's been there for for many many years she reached out last week with it being corrections week and what can they do what can the students there do and i'm like <laughs> good question mm-hmm. i mean I'll, I'll leave that to you and it was just nice to have that interaction you know with her and, and then she's thinking of our team and a couple of the students came in on you know yesterday and, and brought some baskets in just to show some appreciations you know with some goodies and stuff mm-hmm. to to give to our all of our ceos that mm-hmm. hey even the up-and-coming people that are looking to get in this profession are thinking about the people that are doing it right now mm-hmm. and uh, really appreciate courtney um and you know, all of uh, the students over there that are wanting to get into this profession and, uh, you know, recognizing and, and thinking of our team. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, not surprising, but always great to hear about that connection with Mid-State has with mm-hmm. different companies, different businesses, yeah. and certainly with you guys and our fire department and that. No, it's uh, it's huge. You know, not just with the corrections field, but the law enforcement field, the, the fire and, and EMS, those public service um, professions. Mm-hmm. It's great to have something, you know, in our backyard mm-hmm. that that we can not only continually train with, which we we do quite often with our people that are law enforcement officers and corrections officers, but the up and comers. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has been such a wonderful partnership when you know you work with um, the people that have chosen this profession. And then we have um, many of our local law enforcement officers, not only just from the sheriff's department, but Wisconsin Rapids Police Department, Marshfield, Nakusa, um, other law enforcement agencies, you know, teach out there part time. And, and that's just a great opportunity to, to see who's up and coming. Um, you know, who's going to who's going to hire these people first because <laughs> it's a pretty competitive uh competitive field to get into but that partnership is just huge and it's been going on for probably since the early 90s just in the law enforcement side of things i remember when i was a a sophomore at uwsp and i was contemplating going to mid-state and Mm -hmm. the um, law enforcement program the two-year associate degree just started and i was going back and forth back and forth and i chose to stay at uwsp which you know is is great it worked out great for me because i got my degree from uwsp but I still got the opportunity later to teach out at Mid-State Technical mm. College. Um, so that partnership is just is just huge. Um, and, you know, I have to throw out Clark Poggle, who was probably one of the 
first people to start the program who was a part-time officer in Plover mm-hmm. and and was teaching at Mid-State and really saw this program, mm-hmm. you know, got it off on the, on the ground. Mm-hmm. And, and look at how many years later, yeah. what, what they're doing. I can't imagine how many law enforcement officers he taught that are somewhere around not only the state but the country. So a great shout out to him and, and he's still there, um, you know, overseeing the law enforcement academy. And again, it's just a outstanding, awesome partnership that, that we've been lucky to be part of. It's a, it, it's one of those positions in society we don't get a chance to pay attention to enough and put the spotlight on mm-hmm. enough. Uh, and a big thank you to all of our correctional officers thank, out there. Yeah, I appreciate uh, hearing that. I mean, like I said, very proud of our team. Um, they need to be appreciated, not just this week, but every day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. every day. And uh, we did have a promotion back in our jail, um, hmm. Tom King. Uh, was just recently promoted the jail sergeant. So congrats to Tom. Yeah. Uh, looking forward with him moving forward with his leadership role. Um, so uh, there's a it was a competitive process, but mm. uh, he uh, prevailed in the end, and we're looking forward to working with Tom. I was close, right? I was close <laughs> in the right now. Yeah. Uh, congratulations yeah. to Tom. Yeah. Very well deserved. Yeah, very with, well. Of course, that means, though, that leaves a position open. So mm-hmm. how did that go filling that? Right now, we're uh, in the process of uh, interviewing people. Okay. Um, so we've been working with our, our human resources department, and, uh, in fact, we're doing interviews today. Did some yesterday, and we'll do some tomorrow. What we try to do is keep an ongoing eligibility list. So if people are interested, they can check out our uh, website you know, through Human Resources on open positions. And like I said, it's usually a, always open, so you can put, you know, you can apply and send in your resume. And then, you know, it really depends on our need. Uh, if we have a couple openings, we'll we'll be doing uh, we'll be doing interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right now we are. So we have one opening, and uh, we'll fill that fairly hopefully soon. Good to hear. How has uh, that gone when you've had openings and stuff? We've heard, uh, uh, most everybody has heard the, the talk of <clears throat> what it is uh, hiring nowadays. Yeah, it, it's um, <clears throat> been somewhat of a challenge with, with corrections, and it's something that we work with our human resources uh, department. As people apply, we try to you know get in contact with uh, applicants as soon as possible uh, if we have an opening. And like I said, we, let, we try to keep an eligibility list current so... If somebody does leave, then we've got, you know, okay, make some phone calls. We'll either do some interviews or you're already on the list or you're still interested in the position. Then we continue the hiring process. So probably in the last couple of years, we've, it's been fairly ongoing with corrections. Uh, for deputies, um, our eligibility list, we're going to probably start uh, creating a new one within the next few months. But we don't have any openings. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had an opening uh, for, for quite some time, at least over a year. Uh, that was just due to um, some retirements. Uh, like one of our last retirements was one of my best friends, uh, Rang Dohorst. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was the last time we had somebody leave. And then Scott Mahaka was shortly around the same time frame. Both, you know, just great, great investigators, great leaders with the, with the sheriff's department. I miss them both. But the funny thing is, we hire them both back huh. on, on part-time basis. Um, Scott's helping out. They're both helping out doing background investigations, not only for full-time people um, that are going to be considered in the future or um, our part-time, huh. uh, uh, part-time uh, deputies. Um, that program has been around since, I think, the, the 80s, the mid-80s, where we had part-time. We called them reserve deputies, mm-hmm. but now we, we transition to more of a part-time position because... They used to, when they were reserve deputies, exclusively just work the parks, um, which will start after Memorial Day. Um, But now we we looked at it, we could utilize uh, our part-time deputies uh, quite a bit more, whether it's on transports or working in the jail Mm. um, or just um, extra security shifts that, you know, might be out in the community, like the water ski show, Mm. um, those kind of events, you know, that we have uh, any larger scale event in the county. Um, we will assign them to that, and then the full-time patrol deputies can maintain, you know, working, you know, the call volume and, and regular yeah. patrol duties. So it's been a, a great program that we've had for many, many years, and um, we've seen so many people that take that opportunity to work part-time for us get hired full-time somewhere. I would say probably close to 90% of the deputies that we hire full-time we're probably a part-time deputy or reserve mm-hmm. deputy with us. Um, so it's just a, a great opportunity for people that want to get into this profession and get some experience and then get hired somewhere full-time. Um, they're all all over the state and even, like I said, even 
the country where where many of, of the people that took part in our part-time program have gotten the opportunity to work full-time somewhere else. These kind of uh, things that you share with us, too, remind a lot of us uh, of <clears throat> it's something we've talked about before in the past about mm-hmm. retired uh, officers uh, that, that have cases that they will not let go of, cold cases right. and such, and they continue to be on the job even though mm-hmm. they are retired in that. Uh, the way that so many of our officers, like many of our soldiers out there, continue to give mm-hmm. back to our communities even after they're done with the job, if you will. Yeah, uh, no. It's a good point. It's something that any chance we get to highlight something like that as well as, as we were talking about corrections officers, these kind of things, always a nice mm-hmm. opportunity to do. Yeah, with Randy and Scott that I brought up, they both came back after being retired for, for quite some time. I think they missed it, and we missed them. So it, it's kind of it's a Works win-win out. for us, and, you know, they can help us out with, like I said, background investigations on, you know, future candidates, whether full or part-time, or working, um, you know, like you said, a, a case that has been out there for quite some time. And um, that's one thing that Randy's helping us out with right now, just taking a, a, a case that, you know, a, a tragedy that happened in you know in the '90s, and it's still out there, and we and we still work on it, and just getting the opportunity to go through it, and you know, hey, we need to maybe reinterview this person, or maybe we should do this, and um, having that that opportunity and time for somebody to do that, and and it's very dedicated, is helpful, helpful for our team. Yeah, you know, now uh, nowadays uh, with those kind of things, especially when it comes to like TV and movies, they immediately go to the science because the science is so much mm-hmm. different and, and better and advanced than it was yep. five, ten years ago, or whatever. But a lot of the times, it's some of the things that you touched on there. Of maybe it's just re-interviewing somebody. Yeah. Uh, maybe it is a different set of eyes on a subject on a case mm-hmm. that helps bring it to like whatever the the it might be. Just some of the even if it's just one cold case out of thousands, it's right. it's worth it. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at um, when you read the volume of reports that are there and then you take note of some inconsistencies or, hey, why wasn't this person talked to? You know, Or is there some evidence that we might have still you know, stored that we should resubmit? Because, you know, that's one thing. Technology always changes, always is changing and getting better. Um, and that's not anything different with law enforcement. Yeah, and uh, along with the technology getting better, techniques get yeah. better uh, as as far as uh, for for police officers and that, and and the way that they look into these cases and that. So yeah. uh, there's a lot of uh, growth there, a lot of weight reasons to be looking back at these cases, and we appreciate these retired officers. And I feel like I'm using the word retired very loosely because <laughs> they're not stopping working; they're they're still helping. Right. No, you have a great law enforcement career that goes over decades, and then you take the opportunity to. To move forward in life and and that's that's awesome you know for both not all of our retirees but you know it's nice to have uh you know randy and scott come back and and help out and and that dedication never changed there's a lot of great fishing in this state it speaks to that that they give that up just to spend some time with you guys and everything and working on these cases <laughs> oh, and stuff well, scott's a big hunter but yeah, I, don't okay, know, yeah. I don't know what randy does <laughs> you know, i don't know if i want to but, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, we're, of we're, we're speaking with uh, wood county sheriff's department sheriff sean becker and a big thank you to our friends of wisconsin rapids community media also being here we'll take a quick break come back and have some more conversation with the sheriff here on morning magazine we've all heard Welcome back to Morning Magazine, part two on this May 4th, 2022, 1034 on the clock. Have your host, James Dio, here. We are joined by our great friends, Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. Shout out to Joe and the gang over there. And we have, of course, Wisconsin uh, Wood County Sheriff's Department Sheriff Sean Becker with us. Good morning, Sean. Good morning. We are going to get into uh, another thing that's featured in May, and that is Mental Health Awareness Month. Yeah, it is. Um, another thing that, uh, that we're all in on. You know, uh, it's, it's something that... You know, going back just in the history of, you know, just my career, it wasn't really talked about month, you know, much about mental health, mental illness, and how does that fit with law enforcement. And I'll tell you what, in the last probably close to 10 years, it's it's changed so, so much. And, you know, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, we're part of that. You know, today I'm wearing, I will all month, uh, the patch on my uh, shoulders. Uh, that It's green, it's representing me- mental health awareness. Um, you know, all of our, you'll see a lot of our deputies wearing this, uh, these patches. We were selling them to uh, provide, you know, funding for ongoing mental health training for our law enforcement officers. But, again, just something that, that I'm very proud of to, to be, you know, a small part of. You know, it, it takes, again, you always hear me say team effort, but it does, especially when you talk about, you know, mental health. It was, used to be 
you know, and I think there still is some level of a stigma out there, but it's nothing to the level it was, you know, 10 plus years ago. Right. Hey, we're talking about it right now. That right. That's a win, you mm-hmm. know, and then how does that fit in the community? How does it fit in the law enforcement community? And, and what have we been doing about it? Uh, again, we can talk about it all day, but what, what has the Wood County Sheriff's Department, you know, done about it in the last few years? You know, and, you know, I can talk about the jail. Um, the partnerships that we have with the stakeholders, you know, in our community, you know, um, Aspirus Behavioral Health, you know, we, we do have 60, 60 hours of, uh, you know, contracted, you know, counseling in our jail with, with two, two people coming in and working with their inmates. You know, that's not something that we were doing 10 plus years ago. Um, obviously, you know, you know, it's unfortunate, but people do have addiction issues and they also have mental health issues or a combination of both. And, you know, we look at that. You know that that issue that that crisis that that person is going through while they're in custody why not give them an opportunity to get some help um and and that's so important and you know you just look at the partnerships that um that i was talking about not only with this virus but you know mid-state technical college you know coming in and and working with inmates to continue their education uh three bridges recovery you know um there's so many things out there so many people that are, are willing to uh, get out there and help uh, when when somebody people do make mistakes but you have to look at it as hey give that that individual the opportunity to help themselves while they're in custody so when they um, do get released back to the community they can become successful you know so there that opportunity is there they have to want the help but i think that it's a you know our duty to um, give them the opportunity while they're while they're in custody then you look at you know our um our deputies, our corrections officers, again, and what we've been doing um, the past, you know, several years. You know, we talked about the crisis intervention training, you know, starting that off uh, in 2016, holding our own classes. And that wasn't because of me. That was because of, a, again, a team effort with not just the sheriff's department and local law enforcement, but the community stakeholders, human services, crisis intervention, you know, getting the, the people um, together to put on this training is, is just, um, I'm very proud of it. Mm-hmm. You know, we've, we've trained almost probably over 300 local law enforcement officers and corrections officers and dispatchers. You know, that's all part of this, you know, and then you look at internally what else we've been doing to provide for our own people. You know, because this is a stressful job, whether you're in corrections or, or patrol or investigations or administration, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it, 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 it's a stressful job and, and we have to take care, take the opportunity to take care of our own. You know, and we've been doing that, you know, through our, our peer support um, uh we have a peer support system within our organization where if a, a law enforcement officer is having a tough time dealing with the situation, whether it may be a, a tragedy or something else, they have an opportunity to sit down with a coworker, um, you know, that has had some training and just talk about it uh, and, and move forward through it, um, you know, through an employee assistance program. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm really proud of the fact that that we're doing as a team moving forward, not just as a department, not as a sheriff's department, but just with the community. I mean, it just shows that a lot of people are, are talking about this and, and a lot of people are doing something about it. And that, that opportunity is out there within you know the law enforcement profession. And, and again, just seeing throughout my 25 plus year career, how much that's changed. And I'm, and I'm, I'm proud to, to say that, that we've been doing something about it and that's gonna continue. You know, we're all in on this, no matter, Next month or next year, that's going to be something that is a priority that that I'll always talk about and push and and look for, you know, other opportunities that can make us better. And and we've been doing that. You know, uh, again, I can talk about CAT. I've talked about it before, but I want to highlight it just because of of this month and, and how it's fitting not only in the community, but our community is law enforcement officers and, you know, what we can do to be better. And, and CAT fits in that one thing that. You know, talking about Doug Christensen, you, you look at that opportunity and it tells me when we get a legacy grant to fund his position as the mental health deputy, you know, people are, are paying attention to this yeah. and Doug's doing a, a fantastic job, you know, connecting with those stakeholders, working with individuals that are struggling with a mental health concern or issue or illness and trying to, to get them connected with, you know, other stakeholders that can help them through um, the situation that they're going through. Uh, we're also looking at now that we've been doing CIT on our own for 2016, since 2016, 
holding an advanced class, you know, and working with Katie says that you used to work in human re, uh, human services, now as a full-time Roan police officer, but still as a certified CIT instructor, you know, Doug and, and Katie are looking, all right, now we've done this for how many years? Now, we, what are some other opportunities that we can expand upon topics that are affecting us locally? Mm-hmm. And that's, um, you know, working with um, the veterans, uh, working with people with addiction issues, working with, with kids, you know, and holding a, we're in the process of putting together a, an advanced CIT class that could almost be another week, to be honest. But we're mm-hmm. trying to say, okay, what topics do we want to cover now? Mm-hmm. You know, and addiction covers, or, or unfortunately happens everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's in our community. You know, it is. We do have drug issues here. Uh, we do have people with addiction issues here that are connected to mental health issues. And why not continue to take that training and expand upon it? You know, majority of our, our sheriff's department have all gone through it, yeah. including myself. And I think this is another opportunity as we talk about Mental Health Awareness Month that, hey, this is some more things uh, that we're doing. You know, and, and again, connecting with uh, the local community stakeholders. So, um, again, you know, just, I could talk about this stuff blue in my face, well, but it's just something that <clears throat> that I'm passionate about. You know, especially you know our team. You know, uh, unfortunately, I can talk about the situations where we've lost um, you know coworkers that have ended their career earlier that that shouldn't have. But you know, um, it was time for them. Unfortunately, you know that they needed to move on, and that's hard. It's hard to talk about, but you also learn from those um, those situations and how we could you know create better or uh, just to try to prevent something like that because we have to take care of our own and if we don't how can we expect them to take care of the community All right well said um it's a it's a it's a topic that it, it I have to admit it feels good that it's being discussed with such an open air as somebody as a kid that this was told I was told to hush talking about so that feels good just in general and I think as a society we can feel pretty good about that I think you bring up some incredibly important points because oftentimes when we think of mental health and think of it in your field well there are no easy jobs with your field there are no in in more times than not there are hard days as opposed to just a day I got through it. I got, you know, that kind of thing. So when we talk about back in the badge, we talk about back in the blue and these things. These are great phrases. They make a great, nice thing to have on your lawn. It goes deeper than that. It, right. it, it involves these kind of things and making sure that, you know, the, the sheriff was talking about this in the beginning of the show here with our corrections officers and some of the things that they come across, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and making sure that they have somebody to talk to, uh, somebody right. to lean on, those sorts of things. And you bring up the inmates, and that's an important part of it, too, in the, in the aspect of something that goes back to our very first conversation about stopping this revolving door. Right. Like, why does this person continue to commit crimes? Mm-hmm. For every person that does it because they're just a knucklehead, there are other people out there that, well, what made them a knucklehead? What made them feel this right. way? Is it something that can be fixed? Is it something that's so much fixed as it is, uh, you know, talked through or therapeutically done or, or something like that, which helps your community which is one less crime that is being committed in your community Mm -hmm. so even if you don't care about this subject you care about crime you care about your community you care about not having as much crime this all is connected and i just uh i know you're not going to do it so i will i i cannot thank you enough for championing this because it's a shout out to your whole team um but it starts at the top everything does and and if you're not you know championing this who knows where else it goes and and again coming back to the revolving door thing if we want crime to come down we want some of these addictions the the dealing all this stuff Mm -hmm. this is how it happens by taking approach like this we we have the statistics we've had more than two three decades to to prove well raising bail bonds doesn't work or 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 increasing how many years are attacked to a sentence or something Mm -hmm. and there's no criminal in human history and you know this better than i do that is going to stop what they're doing because of a bail bond or something like that now It, what might make stop them from doing it is if when you have them in custody or you have them when they have been caught in something, seeing instead of just throwing them in, throwing away the key, and, and you sit in the corner and feel bad about what you did. Let's find out what's going through that head right. and why they did this. Now, it, it is not... It is not to say, well, okay, you did this because this happened to you, so you get a free pass, you get you get a j- get out of jail free card. It's not the case here. That's not what no. we're talking about. What we're trying to do is stop them from committing the next crime. Right. No, perfectly said. Um, and you're right. I mean, I think 
and I've said it over and over again, uh, if you get somebody that does not come back to jail because they, they committed a crime or made some mistakes and they're out in the community um, working, providing for themselves or family, paying taxes, you know, I think we all win. I can put a cost to what, what it you know, costs a, a taxpayer for somebody that's in custody. You know what that what's that what that looks like, and you know going back to the out of county housing, you know, in one facility it costs thirty six dollars a day, another one it's thirty five, and that's going to go up. Well, do the math, multiply it by three sixty five, you know, and I could give you what those numbers are. But if you have somebody that's not in custody and is working, I I think it's priceless. You know, yeah. I think it really is. People do make mistakes. You know, it's on them to decide if they want to you know get help. And try to, to be a productive member of you know our community, uh, and, and we hope that we do. And you know, getting back to it, it's you know I think it is our duty and and not, not so much an obligation. It, it's we should have these opportunities for people if they want to take advantage of them while they're in custody to better themselves because when they do return to the community, which they will. I mean, people have to understand that the people that are in custody. We'll return to our community, whether it's Wisconsin Rapids, Marshfield, Pittsfield, Nakusa, Grand Rapids, they will go back, you know, and if they can be somebody that's behaving and a productive member of the community, we all win. And if I could add one last point to this before we go to break, um, well, coming back to our officers, uh, and, and for those that don't know, I think this is important stacks to hear. Numbers released by Blue H-E-L-P Help, uh, which is an organization that helps out officers. Uh, this is from uh, 2020, but it also referred to 2021 as well. 228 American police officers died by suicide. That research showed an increase from a study previously done the year before that, so we have seen an increase year after year of this. More officers are dying of suicide than in the line of duty mm -hmm. that shouldn't happen in our society that ain't that it is not something that should be happening and it's something that i don't know how it is not nationally talked about more uh, this is something that's been going on for years so it's all the more reason that if we care you want to back the blue you want to back the badge mm -hmm. that's great wonderful it's deeper than just putting a sign out in your yard or something like right. that it's it's supporting these causes it's a, talking about these things it's making it so yeah. that when that officer is struggling and he's got the old uh, you know mentality that a lot of us were raised on oh i just got to bury this uh, you know what I, if i don't talk about it it'll be okay we need to talk about these things. We need to have this stuff so where it is not a taboo thing to be brought up. It doesn't make you less of a human being because you're feeling this or something. In fact, it shows your strength. Right. No, I completely agree, 100%. Um, we see a lot of things, uh, a lot of tragedies, a lot of, you know, and then other concerns that you, you never know what that might trigger uh, an issue with, you know, an officer. Um, and it's a staggering statistics that you just brought up on how many, you know, people nationally are taking their lives that just tells you that we need to change something or we need to be proactive. And, you know, I will say that, you know, recently Kelvin Doris, one of our lieutenants, along with uh, Chief Deputy Quentin Ellis, have been, they submitted for a grant um, to provide funding for officer wellness uh, for our department um, that, you know, expands on the counseling, peer support, things that we've talked about. And this is something, you know, we've talked about before, but mm -hmm. you know, it's it's being recognized and with the federal with federal dollars out there says that the feds are looking at it as well. We'll take a break real quick and come back and have some more with our Wood County Sheriff Sheriff's Department here on Morning Magazine. I live FHR, locally grown radio, and here we have Morning Magazine going on with our friends from the Wood County Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Sean Becker, and along with our friends at Wisconsin Rabbits Community Media, Joe and the gang over there. Uh, you brought in a badge yeah. that has an incredible story behind it. Yeah, it, it does. Um, one of my mentors, um, Dave Laudy, uh, he's a retired uh, patrol lieutenant from the Sheriff's Department, like I said, a great friend, one of my mentors when I uh, started here. He, um, he's overseeing our patrol division. Shortly after becoming sheriff, he, he, he came across this badge, and it's a deputy sheriff, uh, Wood County, Wisconsin badge, badge number one, and it's got the date out at 1930. So um, after he, he gave that to me, and I'm very, very grateful for it, we started doing some research on it um, because the date's on there, and we figured that the badge uh, number, be number one, must be from the sheriff from that era. And lo and behold, it came back to... A, a relative, or somebody currently working at the Sheriff's Department, uh, Operations Captain Charlie Hugesteiger, it's his great-great-grandfather's badge. Hmm. Um, and, and he was a sheriff at the time, Sheriff William Burke. 
Um, he tragically died on July 16th, uh, 1931. He was transporting an individual to, uh, I believe it was Winnebago Mental Health Facility, and got into a, a, a car crash mm. and, and passed. Uh, oh. So from my understanding, he's the only law enforcement officer from the Wood County Sheriff's that passed in the line of duty. Huh. So you know, I don't know exactly how, how David came up with the badge or how the individual he got it from got the badge, but he gave it to me and then just doing the research on it and just with the history of it. And we found some pictures of, of Charlie's great, great grandfather. And, and it's, it has to be the badge, you know, it has to be. Um, so just, a what a, a di well, weird opportunity or a weird circumstance where yeah. we have some of our memorabilia come back to us and then connecting it to an individual and connecting to somebody who tragically lost their, lost their life. And what we're going to do with it is, um, you know, get it on display with some other um, items from mm. uh, Charlie's great great grandfather, um, the flag that was presented to the family at his funeral, um, and then some other information because the history of it, the, you know, the community should know about it, and uh, and it's important to bring up now because it's another reminder um, coming up uh, on uh, May. I believe it's May 20th. It will be the 36, 32nd annual uh, Wisconsin Law Enforcement Memorial down at the Capitol, honoring all the law enforcement officers in our state that gave the ultimate sacrifice, yeah. like Charlie's great great grandfather did. His name's on that memorial. Oh. Uh, it's on the National Memorial as well. But just something to you know, I wanted to bring up being you know coming up next week or in the next couple weeks. We'll be down. We'll have honor guard members from our our sheriff's department down there, just honoring the people that that gave that ultimate sacrifice. And just the story behind this badge is something you know people should know about. Thank you for sharing that with us and uh, sharing his story with us, so we yeah. can celebrate him as well and that what he did for us, well, our community. That's yeah. that's an incredible, not just an incredible story behind the badge, but but how you got the badge yeah, as well. That's interesting. Well, it's 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 a really honor when when David brought it to me and you know what he went through to get it and you know just. And they to give to me. Um, it's something that you know I'll treasure forever because Dave uh, has meant so much to me. And and just as an individual, as a person, you look at the the people that that you know you look up to, and it's a lot of them, like my my parents, and and then the people in my uh, career. I mean, he's he's number one. Hmm. You know, uh, coming here to to Wood County, the Wood County Sheriff's Department. I, I, you know, you put in an application and you go from there. And you know, I, there's reasons why I want to be in Central Wisconsin. But then you look at the people that that mentor you along the way as a as a young individual, and as your career evolves too into leadership roles. And you look at all right, that's somebody that I want to be like, mm -hmm. and that's Dave Lowdy. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, well said. Mm -hmm. Other things you wanted to touch on before we yeah, let you real go? quick. Um, the environment out there, it's getting nice. Again, we talked about it in the beginning of the year, but Walladay's has been starting down mm -hmm. by Nakusa. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, you know, a, a reminder of people that are enjoying the water right now, the river's, you know, moving. You yeah. know, it's, yeah. uh, I know it's gone down quite a bit, but you have to realize that the current's moving. Uh, and, and think of all those safety issues. You know, make sure your boat's got, you know, all the life jackets. And we did have an incident a couple weeks ago where a boat overturned. Mm. Uh, a couple people from the Illinois area um, went overboard. Fortunately, mm. you know, they had life jackets on. And we we got deputies over there really quickly. And the people are very grateful for, for that because they helped pull them to safety. So, you know, I look at them as heroes. Uh, Lieutenant Scott Sager, Sergeant Matt Susan, and Deputy Joe Zerf, who got mm. over there. Uh, got those the the fishermen to safety. Oh. Uh, the boat sank, and then the next day, uh, Wood County Rescue got out there and recovered the boat for them. Hmm. Uh, the DNR requires that the boat, you know, anything that sunk be, I believe it's like 30 days. Okay. Well, our rescue unit went out there and and took oh. care of that for them. And I know that the people I spoke with, one of the people that are in the boat yesterday, and they're extremely grateful for not only our deputies but our, our rescue unit to get out there and, oh. and help them out. But it's a reminder, you know, especially when you're fishing and, and you know, enjoying the river, especially this time of year, um, you know, the current can change rather yeah. quickly. You know, a lot of it just depending on what's going on up north with the thawing, um, you know, just be aware of that. And I know it's a popular area right now, um, down, you know, just south of Nakusa with walleye days. You're getting lots of people coming there. There's a lot of boat traffic. Just be patient when you're launching and loading your boat and be safe about it. You know, make sure that you've got all the safety equipment inside your uh, in your uh, boat, and make sure you're wearing a life jacket. And want people to be have a good time out there, but mm -hmm. just got to do it smartly. Yeah, totally. Uh, and and a big thank you to those officers yeah. and the work that they did, the DNR. Uh, that's some really solid work right there. 
Yeah, Matt yeah. Souza, who's overseeing our uh, you know recreational patrols, doing an outstanding job, and um, you know he's been out doing boat patrol. We got a great partnership with the DNR, mm -hmm. where uh, they'll either you know partner with with us in our boat, or we'll do vice versa. And right now, that's probably the the bigger area that we're patrolling, just because it's so active right now. Walleye days is very popular. Um, and it's going on right now, and, and a lot of people from all over the state uh, and other states are coming up to do, get some fishing in. We just ask to be patient and just do it safely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when it comes to this type of weather, is there other things that you think people should be keeping an eye out for? Uh, I know that one of the things that I noticed in the years we've been doing this, scammers are, are tend to be around in spring. I mean, not that they have an off season, mm -hmm. but uh, they seem to bring bring in their new, you know tricks and all these things and cowardly acts uh, to this type of season too so something to keep out uh, keep an eye out for as well yeah definitely you're right the the scamming is going on um, throughout the year and and it does get situational you know with the changes of seasons and things like that but just if it's too good to be true uh, don't do it report it um, if you you know what's been going on where and it happened to us the sheriff's department somebody spoofs our number and starts calling people locally and saying hey you have a loved one in jail. Uh, give me uh, $2,000 to buy them out. Or it happens in a, another part of the, the country, but they call here. And, right, right. and we get that. And scammers are doing that because it tugs at people's hearts. Oh, my gosh, I need to help somebody. You know, and um, just be aware of all that kind of stuff. Call us. Um, we'll tell you we're, we're not going to be doing that. It also um, shows you that they, these are not criminal masterminds behind these things. When, you, when the, the, the scammer calls the jail saying that you have somebody in the jail. Yeah. This happened to my dad, where my dad had, a, 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 I'm at the house, and he's taking the call. And the scammer is saying, you have a loved one in jail, so-and-so, my brother Nick, is, is whatever, or this and mm -hmm. that and stuff. And my dad, without missing a beat, he's like, trust me, in this family, we know when they're in jail. <laughs> like, it's... <laughs> It's like, I mean, the, the, these they're not intelligent what they're right. doing um but they are pre, they are prying on intelligent people right unfortunately people fall for it and and people have lost millions of dollars you and, know and it's just it's unfortunate one of the things they rely on is you feeling ashamed about that mm -hmm. and you shouldn't uh no. that this happens to incredibly intelligent people all the time i mean look at the bernie madoff scandal some years back there was a lot of intelligent people that got scammed by that guy it, 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 this kind of thing goes on um don't let them win a second time by holding this information let the uh, sheriff's department let the police departments yeah. know about these scams the more information we have the better we are at attacking these things right and then we can share that information now with other people because they're, they're not going to be the only one yeah uh sheriff uh, before we let you go is there anything you wanted to touch on no uh just uh, you know thank you thank mm. you for the opportunity every month to to be here always look forward to it uh if um if if you uh, need the sheriff's department though if you have things you know side questions or anything like that yeah. they want to reach out to you is there yeah. a way to do that yeah feel free to give us a call our office is um well we're always open 24 7 <laughs> uh, but you know during business hours feel free to give us a call so one five four two one eight seven one five that's a good line that's, a, that's always open that's good thank you for the card for my dad by the way i you appreciate bet. that yeah. big thank you to joe and our friends at wisconsin rapids community media as always and a big thank you to you and the department sir thank you appreciate it be listening to